Hey, we're continuing on in this series uh, called The Greatest. Jesus, or, or the Apostle Paul wrote um, that uh, faith, hope, and love are going to last forever, but the greatest of these is love. So we've been really talking about what, what love looks like and uh, trying to define that with the help of Paul. Uh, you know, I told the last uh, audience that uh, this has been one of those weeks for me, and uh, normally when I'm studying and I'm preparing for you, um, an outline emerges, kind of, oh, you know, this uh, outline, and uh, that becomes the track that I run on, and I, I rolled into this weekend not having an outline, and so this is kind of a pointless message, um, <laughs> but uh, hopefully God will uh, help me in... Uh, in communicating what it is that he's put on my heart to communicate. It, it really is um, the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You know, that's, that's what I'm going to try to communicate today, just the, the essence of who Jesus is, the essence of what it means to be an accurate reflection of Jesus in the world. Uh, how many of you have ever uh, been in the grocery market, you've been in line, and you've seen the tabloids. Have you seen those? Uh, any tabloid headlines ever catch your attention? I mean, they're pretty outlandish, right? Um, I mean, all kinds of different celebrity gossip kind of magazines, whether it be People Magazine or Star or In Touch. Um, or how about The Globe? The Globe comes up with some pretty sensational things, like check out this uh, Globe headline page, uh, I killed Elvis. Wow. I mean, what's Priscilla, you know, referring to here? Her shocking confession. Or the dying queen quits. Um, and so she names King Char or Charles King, William and Kate betrayed, cruel Camilla's triumph. I didn't know if you knew this, but Michael Jackson's body is missing I, I, from his tomb. I didn't know if you knew that. Or uh, Helen's uh, mental health crisis. Um, all of these very sensational kinds of headlines are designed to try to hook us and draw us in, right? And uh, it's, uh, I, I don't know if you ever wondered, what is it about the tabloids that, that make them so popular? Um, there's actually been research done on this. In fact, uh, here's what they found in a recent study. They took participants and they wired them up and monitored their brains, and then they told them gossip. They told them gossip about themselves, both positive and negative. In other words, things that people said about them, positive and negative. They told them gossip about their friends, positive and negative. And then they told them gossip about a celebrity they knew of. And here's what they discovered there was increased brain activity in the pleasure center of the brain when they heard about the negative stuff that was going on in celebrities' lives. In fact, the more negative the information, the more enjoyment they got out of it. Now, now what is that about, right? I mean, here, here's what the study concluded. The study concluded that um, people, when they hear of the negative things going on in celebrities' lives, it takes their focus. It's kind of an escapism. It takes their focus off the negative stuff that's going on in their lives so they can focus on the negative stuff that's going on in somebody else's life. And so here are these people who supposedly are living the good life, right? But when you hear these people that are supposedly living the good life, the life that we really want to be living, but then we hear that they're going through some negative ordeal, we get a sense of pleasure out of hearing that they're having to navigate this stuff. And so it makes us feel just a little bit better about ourselves and in our situation. Now, you may not be into celebrity gossip. That might not be your deal. However, let me ask you this question. Have you ever been wronged by someone or treated unfairly or uh, they've been unkind to you? And then you hear through the grapevine that things aren't going well for them. How do you feel? Do you say, oh, well, that's too bad. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? What you're really saying is, hey, what goes around comes around. 
pal. You know, serves you right. You deserve that, right? It's hard, isn't it? It's hard not to get just a little bit of enjoyment out of hearing that something's not going well for someone who didn't treat you well. And, and so uh, this really kind of gets to the essence of what Paul is talking about now as he tries to define for us what love is. So let's look at this verse, 1 Corinthians 13, 6. It says, love does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love does not rejoice about injustice. Injustice, that word is a Greek word that means unrighteousness, evil, iniquity. It's this idea of unrightness. So in other words, when things don't go right or, or someone does wrong, see, that's, that is unrighteousness. That is injustice. And love takes no pleasure when people do something wrong or things go, don't go right for people. Love does not gloat when someone fails. It's not quick to say, I told you so, or yeah, they deserve that, serves you right. In other words, here, love is always for people, not against people. And love is always for those who are not for us. That's challenging, isn't it? That love does not take this disposition of wishing evil upon those who have treated us poorly. We don't wish hardship on people who've not dealt with us kindly or fairly. Love doesn't do that. Love does not rejoice in injustice when things go wrong or people do wrong. Love does not rejoice in that, but love triumphs or love um, rejoices when truth triumphs. Now, this is why Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 43 uh, through 45. He said, have, um, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. So love is always for people, not against them. And love is always even for people who are not for us. So Jesus put it this way, love your enemies, love those who are not for you, love those who might even stand against you, love them and pray for those who persecute you. In other words, really have their best interest in mind, actually pray that God would somehow bring them to a place where they could experience the blessing of God. Pray for those who persecute you Love those who don't necessarily love you or are for you. Now, here's what's really important that we understand. This has always been God's heart for us. You know that? This has always been God's heart for you. I, I don't know where you're at on your spiritual journey. Maybe, maybe you're here and you're just checking things out on the front end. Maybe, maybe you um, have not been all that, um, you know, kind towards God, maybe you've even at times found yourself standing in opposition to God. Uh, you just need to know God has always been for you, always. He's never been against you. He's always been for you. And I, I think that's really important for us to understand, um, that, that God loves us. And that's the reason why it says that even that God demonstrated his love for us that even while we were yet sinners and, and we had set our hearts against God's way, that God demonstrated his love for us to, that he sent Jesus to set, sacrifice his life for us. He, he paid the ultimate price. So even though we weren't for God, God was for us. And that's always been his disposition towards us. And that's the kind of disposition that he calls us to have as we encounter people. 
In fact, look what it says here in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. It says, he has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. I love that. To act justly, to to really want to get things right and, and really champion this idea that we want to, we want everybody to experience um, things that are right, not wrong. We, we want the right to prevail. Act justly. Seek to get it right. Love mercy. You know what mercy is? It's when you withhold that, what someone deserves, right? When the judge gives you mercy, he's not gonna throw the book at you. When the judge shows you mercy, he knows what you deserve, but he's gonna show you mercy. He's not going to get you what you deserve. Now, that's what God calls us to do in our relationships with people. Not to just give them what they deserve, but to love mercy and to walk humbly. Now, that's hard. It's really hard to do, especially when people have treated us poorly, when they've been unfair or unkind to us. That's, that's really hard. I was searching for an illustration to kind of illustrate how hard it is, Um, and I was reminded of a story that Roxanne told me years ago about uh, when she was in college, she and a group of girls uh, joined a PR team, a public relations team for the college, and they traveled all summer long to go into camps and retreats and churches and represent the college and, and sing and and so they had noticed that other teams of, of girls that have, had gone out on previous summers uh, always came back having gained weight. Uh, it's hard when you're eating camp food and not eating right, you know, that it's, it's hard to keep your weight down. They made a pact together. They said, wouldn't it be great if we didn't gain weight? In fact, wouldn't it be great if we actually lost weight this summer? And so they agreed that they were going to do this together. They went on the Dolly Parton diet. I have no idea what that is. But they went on the Dolly Parton diet, and, and they were going to hold each other accountable. They gave each other permission to hold each other accountable, Right? Well, they're into their summer, and uh, after one of the evening gatherings, all the counselors were going down to the snack shack, and they were going to go and hang out. And so the girls went down to hang out with the counselors at the snack shack. Um, And so one of the team members that she had um, came out with a big bowl of ice cream. And Roxanne, you know, not in a snide way or anything, but just trying to you know, stay in, in, in touch with what they had said that they were going to do, hold each other accountable. She just simply said to her friend, she said, I don't think that's on the Dolly Parton diet, <laughs> wanting to bring some accountability to what she's about to eat. To which her friend responded, the day you can fit in my shorts is the day that you can tell me what I can and cannot eat. <laughs> now, she said that, right in front of everybody. And, and the other girls on the team kind of caught Roxanne's eye and was kind of like, whoa, you know, I mean, what happened? To, we're gonna hold each other accountable, right? Well, Roxanne didn't say anything. It's just, they all just kind of laughed. And then into the summer, okay? Into the summer, the summer's over. And they're making their way back home to Seattle. And they uh, get up, uh, at a lodge in Yellowstone, uh, and they're deciding what they're going to wear. And they decide they had all they had all purchased these khaki shorts as a part of their outfit, you know. And uh, they all decided they were going to wear their khaki shorts that day. And as this gal, the gal who had eaten the ice cream, as this gal was trying to put her shorts on, she couldn't get them on; they wouldn't fit. And Roxanne had actually lost weight over the summer. And so this gal says to Roxanne, hey, would you mind if I try your shorts on? And Roxanne said no. And so she tried on Roxanne's short, and they fit, and she gave her her shorts, and they fit. And Roxanne said, well, I guess today's the day. (laughs) Did I get it? No, she did not. She did not say that. (laughs) She's too kind. But she thought it, Right? But you think it, right? When something like that happens, it's, it's hard in a moment of irony like that when someone says something so unkind. 
Um, and then it plays out the way it played out. It's, it's kind of hard to like exercise discipline and not just get even a, a little bit of enjoyment out of the irony of all of that. But love doesn't do that. When people have treated us poorly and they've been unkind, um, we gotta be careful that we're not getting enjoyment when things go wrong for them. Again, let's look at what 1 Corinthians 13, 6 says. It says, love does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Now, those two words, rejoice and rejoices, they look similar in English, but they're very different words in the Greek. That, that first one, rejoice, it, it's a Greek word that means calmly uh, happy. Calmly happy to be glad. But that other word, rejoices, it comes from a Greek word that means to celebrate with, to take part in another's joy, to rejoice together, to congratulate. So in other words, the first word is, is really um, way more discreet. It's more of a, a disposition of, a, of, of the heart that might produce a slight smile. But the other one, it is like, full-on celebratory. It's a party. It's a congratulation. It's joining in with the joy of someone else. So what does love celebrate? Well, it says love celebrates whenever the truth wins. Whenever the truth wins. In other words, when the fog of deception lifts, when things are seen the way they really are, when wrongs are made right and justice prevails. As followers of Jesus, we are called to be champions of truth. That's what we're called to be. But then it begs the question, doesn't it? What is the truth? How do you know the truth? What's the truth? I've been uh, meeting with a group of guys, and we've been uh, reading the book by Erwin McManus called The, um, the Genius of Jesus. I would recommend it uh, to any of you, but... It's a, it's a great book, and in, in his book, he, he says, one of the challenges during the pandemic has been, um, we've been told to, you know, just follow the science, you know, just believe the science, trust the science, we've been told, right? But he says, you know, how do you, how do you know? Here's the, here's the challenge. Science doesn't speak. Scientists do, right? The science doesn't speak, scientists do. And, and he talks about the fact that scientists can actually get science wrong on their way to understanding the truth. Now, isn't that science? That is science, isn't it? We experiment. We, we try to figure things out. We think we know something, and then it turns out later that we didn't know what, because science doesn't speak, scientists do, and we can get it wrong on our way to understanding the truth. How many of you are glad we're not bloodletting anymore? Right? Uh, when was the last time the leech was like your answer, right? I, I, I think we just need to understand that over time, science, science has always been there, but scientists have struggled with understanding what science is saying and they don't always get it right. So that makes it really, really challenging for us. And, and he says, um, so science is the source, but scientists are the voice, which means there's a gap between the source of truth and what we hear. And that gap is filled by very fallible scientists who are trying to get it right, but then you throw in there maybe some bias and you throw in there maybe some um, less than pure motives and you can get highly qualified scientists landing in dramatically different place looking at the same science. This is what has been so challenging in this season because what is the truth? There is a gap between the source of truth and what we hear. Hard to know what the truth is. But then Jesus comes along and makes a statement that is mind-boggling. 
Look at what he says in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Wow. That's mind-blowing. Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, listen, I'm not, I'm not saying that I have obtained knowledge, therefore I know the truth. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I am the truth, and so everything I say, the truth is not knowledge I have obtained, it's the essence of my being. You get that? There is no gap. There is no gap between the source of truth and the voice of truth. When it comes to Jesus, no gap. He is the truth. He speaks the truth. It's the essence of who he is. He says, I'm the source. I'm the voice. No gap. Love rejoices when the essence of who Jesus is becomes evident in every encounter we have with people. Love rejoices. When the essence of who Jesus is becomes evident in every encounter that we have with people, love rejoices. And, and, I, and I hope you have picked up in this series that, that how we treat people really matters to God. I hope that you've picked up on that. How we treat people, and especially people who are different than us, especially people who don't believe what we believe, especially people who might even posture themselves against us. They're not for us. Remember, love is always for people and even for people who are not for us. We love our enemy. We pray for those who persecute us. Love's disposition is always for people. This is the essence of who Jesus is. And so because he is love, he calls us to be loving people, patient people, kind people, people who are not jealous or boastful or proud, not self-centered or rude. We're not people who keep score, then rejoice when people who have wronged us get theirs. No, as followers of Jesus, we genuinely care about how people are treated. Here's, here's my concern, you guys. My concern is, if we're not careful, we can become people who attend church regularly and treat people horribly. I, I've seen this over the last several years. This incredible disconnect between those who claim to follow Jesus and then the incredibly unloving and unkind things that I see them either say or post or behaviors they engage in. I, I, I've said this, I'm gonna say it again because I'm just gonna keep beating this drum. My prayer, my hope, my vision for Lake City is that we would be known as the most loving people in our community. Radically loving people. People who are not, uh, these people are constantly telling everybody what we're against, but that we're actually for people, not against people, and that Jesus is for them, not against them. And that we can come alongside people who are not even for us, but we, they get a sense that the essence about who we are is that we're actually for them because that's the essence of Jesus. You know, when you, when you let me encourage you again, read the New Testament. Would you read the Gospels of Jesus? Would you take a look at the people he engaged with? Would you take a look at how he befriended sinners? Would you take a look at how he actually got hung on a cross because he was known to be this friend of sinners? I think it was one of the most insightful questions the religious leaders ever asked his disciples, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? But a better question is, if he did, why don't we? That's a better question. 
And we're called to be the essence of Jesus to the people all around us. God is way more concerned with how we treat people than our religious routines. Way more concerned with how we treat people than our religious routines. It reminds me of the prophet Isaiah when he wrote to the children of Israel. And and here's the thing. Um, He writes to people in the seventh century BC who are now held captive, right? They're in captivity. Because after years and years and years of disobedience and unfaithfulness, after years and years of God sending prophet after prophet, trying to get them to turn back towards God, finally, after years of disobedience and sinful behavior, God finally said, you're going to now have to experience the consequences of your sin. And he allowed the Assyrian king to come in and defeat his own people and cart them off into captivity. Let me, let me, let me just say, you can choose your sin, but you don't get to choose your consequence. You can choose your sin, but you don't get to choose your consequence. And sometimes the consequences of our sin goes far, so far reaching, it goes so far beyond anything that we ever really anticipated. And had we known what we know now after having experienced the consequence of sin, we would back up and we would say to ourselves, don't do it. And also, by the way, just because God allowed the Assyrians to come in and take them captive and defeat them, doesn't make God out to be the bad guy. Understand that. He was incredibly patient with them. He waited and waited. He sent prophet after prophet, warning after warning. They were just so hardened in their heart to do what they wanted to do, and they refused to repent of their sins. And so God said, well, then I guess you're gonna have to experience the consequence of your rebellion. And so there reaches a point where his people decide, you know, we really want to make things right with God. We're, we're done with this captivity thing. We want to try to get back in relationship with God. And so in Isaiah 58, starting in verse 2, uh, look, look at what it says here. Uh, God says, they act so pious. <laughs> they come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves here. And now you don't even notice. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting here that God acknowledges their external effort. He even acknowledges their frustration that he's not paying attention to them and not responding to their requests. But then, he, but then he, he goes on to, uh, to, 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 tell them, to tell them why. It says in verse three, I'll tell you why I, I responded. It's because you're, you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What, what good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourself by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like a reed, bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourself with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? Man, God is just going, man, I see what you're doing, but I'm just not impressed. You know why? All your religious activity uh, does not dismiss the way you're actually living your lives, the way you're actually treating people. He said, man, the way you treat people really, really matters. And then he goes on to say what would please him in verse six. No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give Shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. Anybody ever do that? <laughs> Let's be honest. Come on, you're in church. Yeah. Yeah, he's saying, no, what I want you to do is I want you to be responsive to people. I, I, I want you to really care 
about how people are treated. It's interesting that this passage is very similar to the passage that Jesus embraced. Remember when he was in his hometown of Nazareth and he went to the synagogue and the scroll was handed to him and he sat down and he was asked to read from the scroll and it was opened up to Isaiah 61. And, re and remember what, what Jesus said. This is, this is when Jesus is about ready to launch his public ministry, right? And so he opens it up and here's where he reads in Luke 4, 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released and the blind will see, the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, sat down. The eyes of the synagogue looked at him intently, and then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Whoa. He's saying, Isaiah, the guy he was talking about, it's me. I'm the guy. This is actually what I've come to do. I have come to make the wrong right. I've come for the poor, for the captive, for the blind, for the oppressed. This is what I've come to do. And this is the essence of the gospel. You know, there is all kinds of injustice in the world today. And when, when we are operating with the love of the Father in our hearts, there is this intense desire to right the wrongs. There's this intense desire to try to come alongside those who are being wronged and to see something just happen. Right. Let's get this right. Um, I have been watching as you have everything that's been going on in the Ukraine. And um, they say that, that it's, the, it's the largest movement, largest refugee crisis since World War II, that already 2.5 million have left Ukraine into surrounding countries, that there's an additional 2 million that will be refugees within the country itself. Um, the potential of 12 million people being utterly displaced. This is a huge crisis. I contacted Convoy of Hope because I've been asked by a lot of people, you know, hey, is there any opportunity for us to do something? And let me just, let me just say, that's the love of Jesus in you, the desire to do that. The people that have come to me and have asked me, hey, is there anything that we're going to do? That's the love of Jesus. See, Love does not rejoice in injustice, but always rejoices when the essence of who Jesus is is evident in our dealings with people. And Jesus is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness, all of those things, right? And so um, Convoy of Hope was already postured, anticipating everything that was gonna happen, they have partners in all six countries surrounding Ukraine. They just this last week picked up a huge warehouse that will be their, um, their kind of a distribution point in Poland. And uh, they're partnering with a lot of people, churches and relief organizations. And so I thought, given everything that's going on, the loving thing for us to do would be to come alongside our partner in Convoy of Hope and, and make some... Um, resource available through them. Uh, I found this video um, on some of the, the work that they're doing, and I thought um, I would show this and then give you an opportunity to prayerfully consider what you would do in, in response to all of this. So check out this video. We're here at the border of Poland and Ukraine. One of the checkpoints that the Ukrainian refugees are coming through with an organization that is working with every single refugee that comes through here with food, and any resources they may need to get checked in. And so many of these people have been coming for miles from their towns, talking about how their cities have been leveled. Some of them talking about trains that have been stopped, curfews that they have to abide by, because if they don't have their lights off at a certain time, they're considered the enemy. When the war started in Europe, uh, uh, we have to be here because this is a big problem and many, many million people uh, from Ukraine will be, won't go to Poland. 
But in the first moment on the border, will be very hard. Sometimes they wait two, three days. They are very tired uh, and hungry. Prepare food for 3,000 people per day. It's 24 hours, all time, all time. We are after one week and we don't know how many times we need, we have to be here. Of course we will. You do see hardship, you do see trouble in their eyes, but you also see hope as they come on through. Getting that meal and them seeing their kids being taken care of, they have hope. And so we're just trying to feed that as much as we can with every organization we can as we work through this with the people here. I, my hope is finish war, but not finish think about another uh, people. Never finish. Amazing uh, to see how many people want to work together and help another people. This is true love. Yeah, this is true love. When we do something, when we see injustice and our heart breaks, we don't rejoice in that when things go wrong or people do wrong, we never rejoice. But we always rejoice when the truth wins out. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the source of truth, I'm the voice of truth. There is no gap between the source and what I say, I am the truth. I am love, and love is patient, and love is kind. This is the essence of what it means to follow Jesus. We're for people that aren't even for us. We have love in our hearts for people who don't love us. And let me tell you something. When, when God enables us, when God fills us so much with his spirit that, we're, that this is our, the way we respond, it's shocking to people. People don't get it. How is it that you can be so kind so gentle and so loving when I've been so mean and unfair to you. Well, we can't do this on our own. This is something, this is a work that the Holy Spirit of God must do in us. He must transform us from the inside out. We can't do this. But when given the opportunity to come alongside people, the things aren't going right for them and they're experiencing injustice, love would say, let's do something. So we're gonna put this code up on the screen and uh, you can shoot that code with your, with your phone. That's gonna take you to a giving page and if you would like to participate in a gift towards Convoy of Hope in their efforts to come alongside the refugees, this would be an easy way to do that. There, take you to a page, there'll be a drop-down menu, and you can pick uh, Ukraine, I, I'm not sure what it says, uh, Ukraine, what does it say? U Ukraine Relief Convoy of Hope. So you just select that, and it'll make sure that it goes into that pool of resource. Once everyone's had a chance to give, then we will um, send one check from Lake City to Convoy for this effort. Listen, if you're not a high-tech person and this is like beyond you, um, I understand they still honor checks. You can still write a check and, uh, and go old school with it. You can put it in an envelope, just put Ukraine relief effort on it, drop it in the kiosk on your way out, and we'll make sure that all of this goes uh, to that effort. And I want to thank you for being loving people. But listen, before I let you out of here, let, let me challenge you. I want you to think of one relationship right now that you're sideways in. It's gone sideways. 
there's a relationship right now that either someone's done you wrong, they've hurt you, it's not, it's not what it should be. I'm gonna ask you to pray this prayer. It's a dangerous prayer. God, what is one step of obedience that I could take that would represent your love in reaching out to this individual? What, what, what's one loving thing? I'm for people who are not for me. Love is for people that are not for them. So God, what would a step of obedience look like? Again, this is where the rubber meets the road, you guys. We can engage in all kinds of religious activity. You know what God cares about? How we treat people. That's what he cares about. Let's make sure that we treat them lovingly. So Father, thank you for um, this opportunity for us to take a look at scripture, and these principles. And God, I pray that, um, that we would become more and more an accurate reflection of Jesus, that the essence of who Jesus is would just, just permeate our lives and that people who walk away from encounters with us would sense something refreshingly different about us. And Father, we lift up all those in Ukraine. We lift up all those who have been displaced and are heartbroken. And God, we pray that you would establish your presence there for them. And in this moment of weakness, God, become strength for them. And God, we pray that you would take these gifts that we're about to give and God, cause them to multiply to meet the need that is represented there in Ukraine. I pray in Jesus' name. Everyone sat.